Welcome to worship tonight at Three House. This is an exciting night. Scott Keel Cober, pastor of Cedar Falls First United Methodist, is leading worship. Amanda and uh, Robin are the worship participants. And sometimes I ring a chime to bring us in, but because I think that we are each uh, works of God's art and artists and musicians in some kind of way, I'm gonna begin worship with a chord on the piano and invite that to help move us from where we come to worship tonight to gathering together. So we invite God to come into our lives and as we breathe out the pressures, we will be blessed. Let us worship. Pulling back the veil, the love of God uncovers what is hidden. Where evil has left its mark, wounds fester unattended, roots of destruction still reach deep. But God strengthens the weary and steadies those who are afraid. Divine truth is balm. Before healing, there must be honesty. Before repair, a reckoning. Let us welcome what is needed to restore what has been broken. Let us pray. Compassionate one, both tender and righteous, you are so patient with pain and yet so compassionate with justice. Like a paradox to us, to you is simply the movement of love. Teach us to practice this discernment, to know when love calls for gentleness or for challenge when to push and when to be still, within and with others. Amen. One of tonight's readings comes from Isaiah chapter 40. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows upon them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom will, then will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy Spirit. Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. He, his understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The reading of Mark chapter 1 verses 29 through 39. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick and possessed with demons. And the whole city gathered around the door, and he cured many who were sick with various diseases, and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. In the morning, while it was very dark, he got up and went to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions 
hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so I may proclaim the message there also, for what, for that is what I have came to do. And when he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Good evening, friends. Good to be with you from my office at Cedar Falls First United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Scott Keel Kober, and it's good to be with you this Wednesday evening. We're going to dig into this, uh, this story that comes from the first chapter of Mark um, that you've just heard. And uh, I want to say, first of all, that uh, there's a direct connection between healing and preaching in this story. And that's what I want to explore with you tonight. Mark mentions um, that there's a great crowd that is clustering around the door. Uh, they've come to see Jesus, and Jesus only had to perform a couple of healings. You know, we're in chapter one, right? Not much has gone on. A couple of healings, and the whole city was gathered at the door. That's a lot of people uh, together at one door. You, you know, that's, that's quite an image to consider. Good news travels fast, friends. Um, good news about the cure of an incurable illness, the healing of a terminally ill, um, that, would, that would travel fast. Imagine if uh, earlier today it had been announced that the Black Hawk County Health Department had received 131,228 doses of the new vaccine that's one shot, one shot, baby, that if you if they were going to open up the Unidome parking lot and start to vaccinate tomorrow, can you imagine how many people, we'd fill that place, I suspect. I, I would hope, I would hope that most people would want to get that vaccine. Mark says, that evening at sundown, they brought to Jesus all who were sick and possessed of demons and the whole city was gathered around the door. What's Jesus' response? Now, that's the thing. Um, what's his response to this success that he's having? He sneaks out. He sneaks out before dawn to the darkness, and he prays. He goes into the shadows and prays. What? What? Yeah, that's... That's the story as we have it. His disciples hunt him down, excitedly telling Jesus, everyone's searching for you. Once again, Jesus responds. He says, let's get out of here. Let's, let's go into the neighboring towns where I can preach because that's what I came to do. We, like the disciples, may be a bit confused by Jesus' response to his success. Why shouldn't the disciples be confused? We We've only begun to follow you a few days ago. We're in chapter one, right? We've only been preaching for a short time. We've listened to what you've had to say. We've seen the crowds that have started to develop. You're becoming a successful, a successful preacher. Um, stay the course, ride out the wave, fame and success. Start the branding process, my friend. Years ago, there was a, a prominent television television evangelists who, who ran into some problems. I don't know why that is. They run into problems, but um, he ran into some problems. He was imprisoned, and during the time you could hear some who were condemning uh, the man's crime, and at the same time, you could hear others who were heard saying, well, lots of people believed in his ministry. They were helped by him. You can't argue with numbers. Yet numbers and popularity and success, they seem to bother Jesus here more than they please him. Why? He says that he must go and preach. That's why he came. You know, preaching is fine. I, I do it myself from time to time. But why is it better than miraculous healing? Wouldn't that be the thing we'd really want to focus on? Isn't it the Dr. Fauci's of the world that we really want to experience. It's not the preachers, right? Picture this. You, you have some pressing personal problem, some great pain in your life, 
and you call me, one of the local pastors in the Cedar Valley, and, and you want to know if, if you could have some conversation with me, some reflective meeting. And, and you get a recording that says, well, Pastor Scott's not available. He'll be working from Monday through Saturday on Sunday's message. Preaching is more important than your personal problem. Ooh, that would not go over well. I, I, that will not happen, uh, by the way, uh, for me. But why is preaching more important than, than healing? And why did Jesus seem to avoid the crowds and seek time for lonely prayer rather than encouraging the crowds? Isn't the function of being Christ to do God's work? Isn't healing God's work? Isn't it a good thing that the crowds of people are pressing in upon Jesus? To Jesus, going to the synagogue or even house calls, well, they weren't the, the main thing for him. At least not in this passage. It seems that what's characteristic of Jesus is opening the message, the mission and the realm of God that he offers is to open the doors, to extend the mission. It isn't necessarily to wait around for, for others to, to come to the door, but to, to somehow extend the message. God's gift, Jesus' grace, transcends all limits imposed by religion. He doesn't want to settle down at Simon's house. Simon needs Jesus to stay, but Jesus rejects the proposal. He, if he stayed, you know, if he stayed in the house with Simon's house and, and just had people come to receive healings and such, it would have, it would have transformed the movement into a matter of making him a healer only. And that's not what Jesus came for, he suggests to his disciples. Here's the thing. I suspect that Jesus is concerned about the crowds, the success, because he knows that people will follow anybody, almost anywhere, who gives them what they want. Hitler gave people what they wanted. People followed. Crowds followed. Jesus has come to draw not a crowd, not to perform some stunning miracles, not to rewrite the Jewish history and tradition. He's come to preach and cast out demonics in people and in systems that diminish or distort the gracious reign and realm of God. The new teaching of Jesus here in Mark's gospel and his power to heal are all really combined. This theme continues throughout as it's summarized in verse 39, Jesus goes from proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. He goes forth doing those things, preaching and healing, healing and preaching. This is what he's about. It represents the ministry of Jesus in a nutshell. It represents still the ministry that the church is called to as well, those who follow Jesus. Mike Graves says it this way, Jesus' preaching and teaching exists that evil might not. That's a powerful thought. Jesus' preaching and teaching exists. We are to carry on the preaching and teaching of Jesus so that evil will not exist. I think Jesus went away from healing toward preaching because there was still much that needed to be said. He, as the Christ, was able to, to recognize that and, and to move it forward. The Messiah, you see, is not a Santa Claus. Christ is not one who's just a gift giver, come to give everything our heart desires. No, that's, that's not what Jesus is up to. Further, I think that Jesus sought time alone in prayer, and we can look to that as something 
to consider in our lives too, because he needed to further the clarity of his mission, right? We're in chapter one. We're only gotten to 39 verses in here and, and he's still forming and understanding his mission and ministry here in the beginning of the gospel of Mark. He may have struggled with the temptation of fame. And so he had to overcome that by, by meditating for a bit, stepping away from the crowds in a time of, of prayer. So how do you and I tap into that same power, that same connection with God that will give us clarity? I want to reference uh, the other passage that we've heard this evening from Isaiah. I remember that in high school, my father and I had the same favorite scripture, Isaiah 40, 31. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. In fact, my dad, uh, I gave him a t-shirt once that had that quote on it. Now, it was a favorite for both of us, I suspect for different reasons. For me in high school, at least, I was a distance runner. And the idea of mounting up with wings like eagles as a runner, that's, that's a great kind of image. Running and not being weary. You understand why a distance runner would kind of connect with that passage, right? I like the scripture for its motivation to, to run and, and soar in that regard. I never had the occasion of asking my father why he counted it as his favorite. But knowing that he wasn't a runner, it wasn't likely the same reason that I had when I was in high school. I can guess, though, that the overall message of hope for achieving success in one's life, wings like eagles, who doesn't like that as an image for what they want to experience? How do you and I mount up with wings like eagles? Well, from our look at Mark's gospel this evening, it has something to do with following Jesus' model as a servant leader, as one who stood faithful to God's guidance through prayer. Jesus was willing to wait for it. The identifying characteristics of Jesus' ministry we learn in the scripture are that Jesus wasn't looking for worldly fame, but for leading the world to live for God and for the things of God, to usher in the realm of God, the grace of God. It's still the essence of what we're called to. We are to live out that grace and we're to seek after God's grace. We too will know the truth of Isaiah 40, 31. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It's been good to be with you this evening. Um, I, I wish you well and uh, have a glorious night. We come to the time in the service now where we get to live out what it means to follow God and love in the way of Jesus by caring for one another, by sharing our joys and concerns. And that helps us love ourselves and love our neighbors and love all of creation. So we invite you to share your joys and concerns uh, in the comments section uh, or the, the chat or whatever the features are that you're watching this on or send it in the form of an email. But, but lift up the prayers for one another. Uh, and, and we know that in all of our lives there are lots of joys and concerns. So... Join us in prayer. God of hope, you have not left us powerless before pain, not ours, not our neighbors, not that of the groaning earth. With your help, we need not be afraid to confront or be confronted by the truth of what is, what has been, and what may become. Bless each of these, your servants and your children, that they may be devoted to faithful practices of care wherever they are needed most. Amen.
Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word. I am the with thee and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, I thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling, and I with thee one. Be thou my battle shield, sword for the And now we come to the end of the service and I offer these words of blessing and benediction. As we face together the challenges and possibilities of this era, may we remember the love of God is attentive, not avoidant, patient, but not passive. It is biased towards justice, urging and luring and drawing all life towards liberation. The love of God will be known through those pra that practice care, manifest courage, and move us honestly and humbly together toward freedom from evil. May it be so among us as the Spirit companions us with peace. And now, friends, go with these blessing words from Three House. What does the Lord require of us but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God? May that be your blessing tonight and through your living of those values this week, your blessing to the world. Go in peace. Amen.